Welcome to Punchline Talks, politics. My name is Mark Owen, and today my special guest is the Cheltenham MP and Lord Chancellor and Secretary of State for Justice, Alex Chalk. Welcome to Punchline Talks. Hi, Mark. Thank you for having me. No worries at all. First of all, I've got to say congratulations and a happy birthday for tomorrow. Ah, gosh, I was, I'm trying to avoid uh, thinking about that, but thank you very much. You're very good. No worries. No worries. Well, I thought I'd do my research. OK, the other day right. we had a report on Punchline and um, shocking extent of child Poverty in Cheltenham, a staggering 91% of pupils live in poverty in Cheltenham, most deprived areas. And quite shocking figures, actually. Now, we've got the Golden Valley de development coming down the road. How important is it that, you know, these kids are brought up or people are brought out of poverty, really, that it's using the right positive... Right. Areas? So, look, the, the, so before, like, long before I came into politics, because Cheltenham's my hometown or whatever, and one... One of the things that I found really shocking is that of the 18 wards that make up the constituency of Cheltenham, three of them are in the bottom decile of income per capita, not just anywhere in Gloucestershire. And we know there are areas of deprivation in Gloucestershire, not just anywhere in the southwest of England. And we know there are areas of deprivation in Cornwall and goodness knows where. Right. Not just anywhere in England, but anywhere in the United Kingdom. So three of the 18 wards, and they have been for a very long time. Now, my feeling is wherever you sit in the political spectrum, that should shock you. And there has to be a plan to try to address that. My feeling always was, which is why I, you know, I came up with the, well, one a principal drive of why I came up with the cyber park idea is because I want there to be what I call the bright lights theory. What I mean by that is that if you're a young person and you're walking down Princess Elizabeth Way, you're coming down from Coronation Square, your parents might not be working, your grandparents might not have worked or whatever, there may be generational deprivation. I want there to be bright lights in your neighborhood. Something which says to you, you can make something of your life. You can go as far as your talent will take you. Because let's be clear, talent is evenly spread across Cheltenham, but the opportunities aren't in the same way. And, that, and that's why, you know, one of the things I'm most proud of is that if you look at, for example, Gloscoll, as you know, just off PE Way, they've had four million pounds of government money, which has been put into a, a, a digital accelerator, uh, effectively it's... Um, it's a, it's a sort of cyber skills center there where people can learn the first ever GCHQ accredited cybersecurity course. So like you can't get that anywhere else in the country. You've got it in Hester's Way in Cheltenham. And then upstairs in Gloscoll, there's the opportunity for incubator space where you can grow out your uh, business. So, so that's the kind of bright lights which are in our neighborhood. We've got 23 million pounds to build out the cyber park. So that's already improved a lot of the roadworks down to A40 and, and, and so on. And it's critically important that we make those bright lights burn even brighter because my strong view is the talent is there we've got to unlock it so people can turn their lives around and build great futures for them and their families I mean, it always shocked me that obviously we have so much you know wealth in Cheltenham yeah and on the flip side this this poverty that is yeah. and, and, it, look, and, it, and a lot and of people like, let's be honest Alex a lot of people don't go to those areas a bit like Barber yeah, Street here in Gloucester yeah and you and, and it's a but you know the the, the odd thing is that some of our most precious and vibrant and strong communities might be in those which are monetarily not as prosperous as others and you know i, I was recently with, with the, the government's putting a load of money um around a, a sort of digital hub in oakley so in the old library there and i went uh was there recently and when i've knocked on doors in in oakley and wadden area the number of times you knock on door and someone says oh yeah no can you help me with this issue and by the way my sister lives over there and my auntie's around the corner and there's this incredibly special tight-knit community so you go to the cornerstone center nearby in that area and the sense of community is amazing so yes there are areas of deprivation but i wouldn't want your listeners to think that there is a sort of ingrained uh, sort of hopelessness not a bit of it it's some of the most positive places and vibrant and contributing communities anywhere in Cheltenham so it's important that they're not stigmatized but at the same time for goodness sake let's unlock opportunity that's what really that's what got me into politics social mobility is the single most important thing to me I want people to go as far as their talents will take them and I think in Cheltenham we've got potential to unlock a lot of that a lot of that potential now, there's so many things I could talk to you about. Obviously, you've been a very busy chap since you've sort of got there in April. Um, you, you've also uh, announced uh, the victims of rape and sexual violence will be better supported for a 26 million boost to rape and sexual abuse support fund. Can you tell us a bit about that, please? Because it's something that you feel passionate yeah. about as well. So I, 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 before I came into politics, I was a, a barrister, as some people would know, and I used to prosecute a lot of rape uh, cases, serious sexual offences and so on. 
And I was always very keen to try to ensure that that victims don't feel like they are spectators of the criminal justice system, but they're participants in it. So that means that we, you know, to, to address that, we've introduced something called a victim's code or we've updated the victim's code, which means that if you, heaven forbid, find yourself the victim of crime, then there are core entitlements that you're able to expect. One, to be kept updated about how your case is progressing. Two, that if the CPS decide to drop a case, that they should say, right, Mark, this is what we're planning on uh, doing. Do you have any representations? If they do drop it, for you to be informed about your right of review, for you, if you're going down to Gloucester Crown Court to be given a court familiarization visit, you know, all the to be told about compensation if appropriate. But if you don't want to see your assailant, your alleged assailant, then you want to be told about special measures so you can give your evidence behind a screen. Meanwhile, we're also giving a load of money to the likes of Chris Nelson, who's the police and crime commissioner, who's doing an excellent job, incidentally, and to ensure that he can provide support for places like Grassac, Gloucestershire Rape and Sexual Assault Centre, or GDAS, Gloucestershire Domestic Abuse, because we want to support uh, victims of crime, particularly uh, where they, well, all victims of crime, but I, I'm particularly focused on trying to ensure that rape cases are being properly prosecuted. Finally, I wanted to say, is in order to do that, we've kept some of the Nightingale courts, which we associate with the pandemic, we kept them open. So Dan Sirencester, that Nightingale court is still in place. It's still doing brilliant work, uh, ensuring that the guilty are convicted, the innocent walk free, and the public are protected. Well, I'm glad you brought that up, because how is the backlog of cases coming now? Because it was right. tremendously, A, there was a backlog anyway, yeah. then we had COVID, and it got bigger. So how well, are the... It's, impo it's, impo it, it's important, I mean, look, the, 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 it's important to, when you look at the criminal justice system, to remember, and it may be your listeners know this, but some some might not, that around 90% of all criminal cases aren't in the Crown Court. <laughs> They're in the Magistrates Court. And the Magistrates Court actually snapped back really quite strongly post-COVID. And it's not, it's not kind of, you don't have to be a genius to realise why, because in the Magistrates Court, you've either got a single judge, which means that if Mark Owen is unfortunate enough to find himself before the Beaks, his case will be dealt with quite quickly, or you have three um, lay magistrates. And again, they can get through it quite fast at Cheltenham Magistrates Court. And incidentally, the magistrates do an exceptional job. So it's about 10% of cases, or slightly fewer than 10%, that are in the Crown Court. Now, pre-COVID, we had about 39 thousand cases there or thereabouts now you might say that's a backlog it's not actually you need to have a caseload because if you don't have a caseload then you can't uh, list cases in an efficient way so that actually wasn't a particularly high caseload and i pause to note that it's much lower caseload than in 20 in 2010 but as a result of covid the number of cases stacking up did did increase and so and then there was also some um uh, there was the cba strike the criminal bar association strike the net effect of that is that means that you do have pressures in terms of how the judges can go and list cases, how they can bring cases on. There is more pressure in the criminal justice and that has an impact on uh, prison population, has a prison, uh, an, an impact on the timeliness of cases. Our job is to throw as much resource as we can to allow the courts to heal, which is why we've lifted the cap on what's known as sitting days, which in plain English means you say to the judges, Frankly, you, you can have as many days, you can sit in court four, court five, whatever it is at Birmingham Crown Court, as many days of the year as you can find barristers and solicitors to do. Just get on and get through the case. We've done that. We've kept the number of uh, Nightingale courts, as I say, 23 Nightingale courts. So you just maximize, we're putting a whole load more money. I'll be announcing tomorrow. Don't, uh, don't tell your listeners. I'll be announcing a whole load more money that is going to be going into the maintenance of the court system to try to uh, make it as attractive a, a profession as possible and particularly for court users. So we're doing everything possible to put resources into the system to bear down on that caseload. Well, let's talk about that, if that's okay, about the, the, the money, because this isn't going to go out until tomorrow anyway. Right. So until then, so can you tell us all about it no, now? Sure. So look, so I, I'm um, a practitioner, as you know. I, I, you know, I'm a legal aid barrister by profession. Yes, I'm in politics now, but I but I see this as a as a sort of a, a career break from from the, the real business. I'm a professional lawyer. That's what that's kind of my identity. And the reason why I mention that is because when I was practicing, whether it was at the Old Bailey or Blackfriars Crown Court as was or Southwark or Inner London or wherever it was, you know, the fabric of the court buildings really, really matters. And that's to say, you know, it's hard to uphold the, the dignity of the law. And the dignity of the law is important because when your listeners, if they find themselves going into court and the court makes an order, they want to know this counts for something. You know, orders are there to be obeyed. And frankly, the you know the, the, the environment that you're in matters. And if there's a bucket in the corner collecting collecting drips, you know, that's not that's not right. And so when I came in, um 
I was very clear that I wanted to invest in our court infrastructure. And uh, that is to do stuff like repairs and maintenance, but to frankly tidy the place up, also to try to improve disabled access and so on. So that is something that I'm very keen to, uh, to do. And I'm pleased to be able to announce that we are going to be investing a very significant additional sum, which I, I can't give you the precise figure now because I've got to do it at Bristol Crown Court uh, later uh, later today. Um, but it's it's very very exciting, and it's going to make a big difference for court users. And I think it's um it's I, I think it's extremely welcome. So, so what you're saying there'll be more money for Blackfriars Court then? Well, won't be for Blackfriars Crown Court is a court in London, which that actually no longer is. No sorry, longer I mean, the Blackfriars in, in, sorry, where, in, in Gloucestershire. Gloucestershire. Yeah. So, so, for example, you know, in Gloucestershire, we've got Gloucester Crown Court. We've got Cheltenham Magistrates Court. What it means is that the pot of money that is available to 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 refurbish and to keep in good repair, these court buildings will be very significantly increased. And that's something that I'm uh, I'm very proud of because I think it sends a critically important message. One, it sends to the judiciary, uh, to the people who work in the courts, we value the work you do. Two, it sends a message to litigants. We care about the system of justice and the justice that you will get to protect you and your family. And three, it says something about, about the dignity of the law and the importance that we attach to it. We are a rule of law nation. We have a proud history of the rule of law. Uh, and I think it's important that we reflect that in the resources that we put into the court system. Now, I just read online, actually, that uh, the Bibby Stockholm barge is uh, starting to be filled with uh, migrants. Yeah. Now, that must have been a bit of a headache, you know, legally and goodness well, gracious, how much work's gone into that? Yeah, look, like a huge amount of work and a huge amount of work is going into the uh, illegal migration bill uh, because we want to ensure that the uh, the Rwanda scheme works. And I, I just want to be to be clear, this is basically about fairness in a rule of law country. We have to be able to send the message that if you play by the rules and do the right thing, in other words, you come to the UK legally, it shouldn't be right that you will see the queue being jumped by people who've come here illegally. You know, that's not fair. It's not fair on those people who've recently arrived, nor is it fair on the taxpayers in Cheltenham, in Gloucester, in Tewkesbury and so on, who are contributing to an overall £6 million a day of people being kept in, in four-star accommodation in circumstances where they've arrived illegally. And I just pause to note that it has been illegal to arrive uh, in this way on boats since 1971 you know this isn't this isn't new but the issue is the scale of it the fact that you have these criminal gangs who incidentally do not care once they receive the cash whether the people in those boats live or die they simply don't care you know and if we don't stop this there will be more deaths in the channel and i just say to those people who who um are unhappy about this look i you know, what is the alternative? We've got to address this. Otherwise, you're sending a green light to these criminal trafficking gangs to say, go for it. Don't worry. The British taxpayer, the Cheltenham taxpayer will pick up the pieces, will pick up the tab. That's not fair on the people of Cheltenham. And it's not fair on those people who've played by the rules when they've come to our country. This is a very, very fair minded country, I'm pleased to say. We've offered comfort to people from Ukraine. There are Hong Kongers in Cheltenham. I'm delighted. There are Afghans who've come the right the right way. They've done the right thing. We should be fair uh, to everyone. And particularly to those who've worked hard, played by the rules and done the right thing. Now, the last question I've got for you, actually, uh, you were recently a, a civic um, sort of cleanup day in Cheltenham. Yes. Uh, and you were, you know, tidying up and all that sort of stuff and cleaning off graffiti. You were deep, That's it. A deep clean on the Howie Street and stuff like this. And then, lo and behold, a chap comes called Turbo and there's a photograph of you cleaning, Tur you know, the, the, the wall of Turbo. Yeah. And there he is again. At the, yeah. at the Cheltenham Paint Festival. So why can't we, why can't it's the court sort of get, get hold of these guys and, and, and do something it's about it? Please. Do you know, it's absolutely outrageous. And I, it, it, it's, you know, in doing this, in behaving in this way, it's thoughtless. It's, it's completely uh, inconsiderate to the rest of the population. It drags down an area. Cheltenham is a beautiful town and it makes it look down at heel and scruffy. And I would just say to the, the local authority, go after, you know, clean this stuff off if you, if you, you know, 
please just allocate some resources to do it. I hope that people will also be uh, arrested and prosecuted for this stuff. It's criminal damage. It's a serious criminal offence. And I would hope and expect that the authorities would set an example uh, in respect of those who behave in this thoughtless way. It's not right that taxpayers should have to be spending a fortune to clean this stuff up and people to act with total impunity and effectively thumbing their nose at the authorities. So uh, I would like to see you know, people being convicted, punished and disgraced for this behaviour. It's not a victimless crime. Crime. It's an offence against society as a whole, and it should receive robust punishment. Alex Chalk, thanks ever so much for joining Punchline Talks. Great to see you. Thanks again. for having me. Have thanks a great day me. tomorrow. Bye.